Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday Bible Life today. December 31st, the last day of the year of 2020. I'm sure that there are a lot of people will be glad to have 2020 in the rearview mirror. And so all of us, I'm sure, are looking for better things and a happier time in the year 2021. And uh, we'll hope and pray that that's the case. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? If you have your Bibles, uh, get them and turn to Genesis chapter 12. That's where we're going to be uh, today in our study. A couple of weeks ago, we started a study of general prophecy after we finished going through the study of the parables. And uh, last week, we kind of jumped ahead a little bit and did a little bit of scattering between the Old Testament and New Testament because it was Christmas Eve last Thursday. And so we looked at some prophecies that had to deal with uh, the Lord Jesus coming, the promised Messiah. This week, we're going to get back to uh, being in step with our study of general prophecy. And we're working our way, uh, slow as it may be, from Genesis to eternity looking at various prophetical things in God's word and seeing how they have relevance to us even in the day in which you and I live. So uh, the last uh, Thursday Bible Life today of the year 2020 will be in Genesis chapter 12 and the main subject that we'll be looking at will be the Abrahamic covenant. So uh, if you have your Bibles, Turn to Genesis chapter 12, and, and we'll get started. I think I've got the clocks fixed where they won't make a big bunch of noise before we're done. And uh, so here we go. As we think about a couple of weeks ago when we started this study of general prophecy, we started way back in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15. That was the first prophecy that we came across in scripture and it was after Adam and Eve sinned the fall of man it's referred to and God uh, brought a curse upon the land and uh, because of the sin of man and he gave a prophecy to the serpent who represented uh, Satan the devil and said that uh, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And we even used that last week in our discussion about prophecies for Christmas time, the first coming of the Messiah. And I believe that that also lends itself to looking at a time yet in front of us out into the future when the Antichrist representing the seed of Satan and his one world government, one world religion, and his attempt to overthrow God and to be worshipped himself will come to naught. And when the Lord returns to set up his kingdom, he will indeed bruise once and for all uh, the Antichrist, the seed of the serpent's head. So one of the things that we talked about last time was the amount of time that... Uh, takes place during those first 11 chapters of Genesis. Uh, we mentioned that the early church fathers and especially the Essenes, who were the ones that were uh, responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran, um, talked about that the age of man would be for 7,000 years and it was divided in their understanding from God's uh, giving them revelation that it would be divided into four ages. The first three ages would have 2,000 years apiece, and the fourth age would be a 1,000-year period. And last week, or a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that the first 11 chapters of Genesis that covered the time from Adam to the call of Abraham covered 2,000 years. Well, uh, I have a, another piece of paper that I wanted to show you that is a comparison. And Genesis 1 through 11 covers 2,000 years of man's history. 
And then the rest of Genesis, the, th the uh, 39 chapters, including chapters 12 through 50, cover only about 300 years. So we see that the amount of time that's covered slows down. And so it's as if we've been looking out the window of an airplane at 30,000 feet through the first 11 chapters. And all of a sudden, we're in a crop duster airplane, 150 or so feet off the ground. And we swoop down now, and time slows down as far as the amount of information that we're given in the rest of the book of Genesis from chapter 12 through chapter 50. And it uh, covers a lot less time and so it gives a lot more information, a lot of detail, a lot of history. It covers the lifespan of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We refer to certainly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob many times as the patriarchs. And it will take us from the time of the call of Abraham that we will get to in a minute in chapter 12 all the way up into the time when God is ready to uh, deliver the children of Israel who have grown to be a pretty sizable nation by that time out of the land of Egypt and out of bondage led by Moses to the promised land. So in those first 11 chapters of Genesis, there are tremendous amount of things that are given to us there that find their fruition even at the end of the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. But some of the things I wanted to uh, read to you and mention to you that are covered in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and maybe when we're through with our uh, study of general prophecy, someday out into the future, maybe we'll go back and study the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And, uh, but the things that are covered in those chapters include the following. God's creation. In other words, evolution is a theory that's made up of man. The Bible presents God as being the creator and that he created everything. So God's creation is uh, the first and foremost thing that we come across in those first 11 chapters. Then we, we, we find God's design for marriage, which was one man for one woman for a lifetime. And we found that in the first 11 chapters. Then we found man's sin, the fall of man, and our need for a savior. We found the first prophecy of the coming savior that we talked about from Genesis 3.15. We found God's example and object lesson for satisfactory sacrifices for sin. When God slew an innocent animal in the garden to provide a uh, coats and clothes of skin to cover Adam and Eve after they sinned. We find in the first 11 chapters uh, a history of Adam's descendants and the beginning of the nations of the world. We find the introduction to what some Bible scholars refer to as the Noahide laws. Those are basic moral laws that every nation on the earth uh, God holds responsible for keeping such as not committing murder and things like that. And this was several hundred years, even thousands of years prior to the Mosaic Law. And then in the first 11 chapters, we also find that famous story of the Tower of Babel and how God had given instruction to the people when they got off the ark after the flood to scatter across the globe and, and to uh, replenish the earth. And uh, we find that they all congregated in that place called Babel. And God came down and at that time uh, they had one particular language and God confused their languages. And uh, uh, so that took place at Babel. And so I guess that's where the, the phrase a babbling idiot comes from, huh? <laughs> so uh, those are some of the things that we find in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And they're tremendous doctrinal teachings and uh, God's revelation to us from his word. And uh, so the rest of the book of Genesis, chapters 12 through 50, cover the lifespans of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. 
And so now if you have your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 12, we'll read the first three verses, which is our first introduction to what we understand as the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Lord had said to Abram, we think of him as Abraham. In the very beginning, his name was Abram. And we'll see next week that his wife's name, Sarai, uh, his name will be changed to Abraham and Sarai's name will be changed to Sarah. But we'll get to that next week. So he says here, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the beginning of what we understand to be the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> and the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. But there's at least four things from these three verses concerning this covenant that God made with Abram that we now understand as the Abrahamic covenant. And some people say three things, some say four, some more, depending upon how you divide them up. But here's some things to think about that we learned in those three verses for this covenant. Abram's name would be become great. And we know next week we'll see that it will be changed to Abraham. And from him will come a great nation. From these verses, we discover that there is a promised land that will be given to Abraham and to all of his descendants. And in fact, we'll refer to it uh, for quite some time as the promised land. We understand that it also was referred to as the land of Canaan. Uh, incorrectly, people refer to it a lot of times in our day and age as Palestine. But the Bible never refers to the land of Israel or the promised land or the land of Canaan. It's never referred to in scripture as Palestine. And then another thing that we find in this uh, covenant is that Abram will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. That includes your family and mine. And we'll discover how that came about and is still ongoing as we go through our uh, prophetical study. And then another thing about this covenant is that those who bless him and his descendants will be blessed. And contrary wise, those who curse him or his descendants will be cursed. And so one of the things that in Thursday Bible life today, it, we always want to keep in the front of our mind is that our objective is to look at scripture and to find principles from God's word that we can apply to our lives today. Hence the name Bible life today. And there's tremendous importance to our lives today and in fact to everybody in the world today in reflection back to this Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. That means there's nothing that any man has to do or can do to either make sure that it's fulfilled or to stop it from being fulfilled. There are conditional covenants that we'll discover as we go through our study. And conditional covenants would be like, if you do this, then I will do that for you, would be God's instruction to man for a conditional covenant. And one of them that we'll get to uh, very quickly will be the Mosaic covenant, which includes the Mosaic law. And that was a conditional covenant. And that particular covenant said that if the people in, of the nation of Israel, after they've been led by Moses, by God's direction, away from Egypt into the promised land, and during that wilderness wanderings, they received the Mosaic covenant and the Mosaic law. The instruction in that conditional covenant was if they would be obedient to God and do what he'd said, and worship and serve him as he told them, then he would bless them beyond their imagination. 
They would become the head of nations. Uh, they would lend and not borrow. Uh, they would rule over their enemies and none of their enemies would rule over them. But the opposite side of that was that if they were disobedient to him, then he would allow, God would allow their enemies to overrun them and then they would be exiled out of their country. And we see that that's exactly what happened. And for almost 2,000 years, they were out of their country from about the first century AD until 1948. There was no recognized nation of Israel. But that never did negate or do away with the Abrahamic covenant because it was unconditional. And we'll see about that in a little bit as we make our way through this. Uh, there's a man named Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum who uh, founded the uh, ministry called Ariel Ministries. I think he currently resides in San Antonio. That's done a great study on the various covenants of the Bible. In fact, he recognizes eight of them. And uh, someday maybe we'll discuss all of those. But he has done a great study and gives good information about the difference between conditional and unconditional covenants. And as we go through our study of general prophecy, we'll be involved in quite a number of covenant uh, studies. And so we'll point those out as we come to them. But the main thing about this one today, the Abrahamic covenant, is that it is unconditional. That means that God, no place in his word or nothing that he's ever said or done has been done to negate it or to end it. That means that when he made that promise to Abraham, that that land that he had in mind for them to inherit is, was, and always will be theirs for all of eternity. God refers to it as his land, and he has his people, his chosen people, as the ones who will steward over it, and they will inherit it. And we'll get to more of that as we go through our study. The next place I want us to look at is in Genesis chapter 13, the next chapter. And we'll look at verses 14 through 17. And in the book of Genesis, early on from chapter 12 going forward, we find three or four times when this Abrahamic covenant is either reviewed or renewed with Abraham and his descendants, Isaac and Jacob. And we'll work our way through that. But today we're going to be only looking at him dealing and talking directly with Abraham, or Abram as his name was at that time. Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, that was his nephew that he took with him when he left the Ur of the Chaldees area and went, followed God's instructions to that promised land. And uh, there came a point in time when Abraham's family and possessions was so large and so was Lot's family and possessions so large that they had to part company. And so the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. So here is a review of this Abrahamic covenant. And he told Abram, after he gave Lot his choice of where he would go, and he ended up going towards that valley where Sodom and Gomorrah was, uh, which for him was a, a proved to be a, a mistake. But then God told Abram, look in every direction, as far as you can see, the land I have given to you and to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. So from this review of the Abrahamic covenant, after Lot and Abraham had separated company and went separate ways, we see that there was this review of this Abrahamic covenant that it would be again to Abraham and his descendants. 
And it also promised that his descendants would be so numerous that they would be like the dust of the earth. You couldn't number them all. And at this time, remember that he and his wife have never had a child yet. The next thing that we, I want us to look at in our traveling through uh, these chapters is kind of a side venture. And it's related to what we've been looking at on Wednesday evening Bible studies. And it comes from Genesis chapter 14. And it's uh, this time that we look at this person or name, Melchizedek. And we've been looking at the ancient priestly order of Melchizedek on Wednesday evenings. And we're about two-thirds of our way through that study. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. In other words, Abraham gave a tithe or a tenth of the spoils of that war that he had won against the eastern kings uh, to Melchizedek. So from this, there's some things I want us to think about in relationship to the Abrahamic covenant and our study of prophecy things as we go through from Genesis to eternity. The information we find here about Melchizedek is one of only two places that we find his name mentioned in the Old Testament. The other one, uh, you will maybe recall if you've been joining our Wednesday evening Bible studies, comes from Psalm 110, verse 4. And it speaks prophetically about the coming of the Messiah and he be, him being a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And then, if you will recall, we find a whole lot more information about Melchizedek in the New Testament book of Hebrews in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And the importance of this uh, study of Melchizedek to us and our uh, study of prophecy is that we find, especially in the book of Hebrews, as well as in Psalm 110, that the Messiah, we know to be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has become and will always be the ultimate and final priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So as we were going from chapter 13 to 15, I thought we'd stop and take a glance at that uh, first and uh, first of only two references of Melchizedek in the Old Testament. The place I want us to come to now, which will end up our study for today, is in Genesis chapter 15. And we'll begin at verse 1 and go through, uh, I guess, the chapter to verse 21. It's the third time that God has given or reviewed this Abrahamic covenant to Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, which was the son of one of his servants. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. In other words, had he died then, uh, his estate would have fallen to one of his servants. And remember that that was one of the, uh, the things of the Abrahamic covenant. He would become a great nation, and his descendants would be so numerous you couldn't count them all. And verse 4 says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven. Count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That is a foundational statement that is in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 6. And we'll find that the apostle Paul will use that and his logical, theological reasoning about salvation being a gift of God in the book of Romans and also in the book of Galatians. And he will quote from this that Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness, teaching that salvation is by faith, nothing that we can do. 
Verse 7 says, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. What we're seeing here is a, uh, an object lesson of the way covenants were made back in those days when there would be two parties make an agreement. They would uh, have a sacrifice and they would sacrifice animals and they would split them in two and separate the carcasses in half, one on one side and one on the other. And then the two comp parties that agreed to the covenant would walk together side by side between those uh, carcasses, uh, signifying that if either one of them broke the covenant, then they agreed that it would be done to them as it had been done to those sacrificed animals. Verse 12 says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then God said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them. And they will afflict them four hundred years, and also the nation whom they serve I will judge. We know now that he's referring to when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And we'll get to that later in our study when uh, we're going to follow those uh, people from the nation of Israel out of Egypt toward the promised land. Verse 17 says, And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, that represented God walking between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. A whole lot of ites, <laughs> like parasites. All of the land that they uh, lived in was going to be part of that promised land that we see here. It goes all the way from the river of Egypt, which most Bible scholars would believe to be the Nile River, all the way over to the east to the Euphrates River. And the people in Israel have never occupied all of that territory yet. But when the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom, they will occupy it then. So from this we see that even though Abraham was getting old, or Abram as his name was still at this point, he was promised an offspring of great number. And we see that Abram believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And this was before the sign of the covenant, which was circumcision. And we'll get to that next week. What that's significant to you and me is that the circumcision became uh, identifiable with the nation of Israel. And all Gentiles who were anybody on the earth who were not Israelites would be considered Gentiles. And most of us who... Uh, are in our country today, either are completely or mostly Gentile in our, in our inheritance, in our family trees. <clears throat> and so when Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and this covenant said he would be a blessing to all people, to all families of the earth, that's significant in that it was before uh, he was given the sign of the covenant, which was circumcision, that tied him then uh, directly to the Jewish people. We find in this portion that the cutting of the covenant, the sacrifice of the animals, and the walking between them, carcass, uh, between the carcasses, that only God walked between the carcasses. He caused a deep sleep and a trance to fall upon Abram. That means that since God was the only one 
that walk between the carcasses. It's an unconditional covenant, and there's nothing that Abram or any other man can do to negate it or to stop it or to fulfill it. That's all the responsibility of God, and that's why it's considered an unconditional covenant. And we see here the boundaries of the promised land was from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, some way, uh, a place that's never been fully occupied, but in the millennial kingdom that we'll talk about way down the road in our general prophecy study, they will occupy it. Well, we'll stop there. Next week, we will begin our study with the uh, another uh, reference to the Abrahamic covenant when God gave the sign of that covenant being circumcision to Abram. And then we'll begin to see uh, some of the offspring and uh, the descendants of Abraham show up in Scripture. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Help us as we go through your word in our study of general prophecy on a journey from Genesis to eternity that we would gain what you would have us to learn from your word that we would find ways to apply it and help understand the way things are in the world today in light of and in view of what you've given us in the Bible thank you so much for these who join us online I pray that you would continue to bless them with uh, good health and uh, keep them safe Father, we are thankful for this year that you've given us and helped us through this difficult time. We pray that you would continue to bless into the next year and that uh, that might be the year in which the Lord returns. But your will will certainly be done. And so help us that we might be found by the Lord when he does return, obediently serving you and worshiping you according to what you've told us in your word. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. So I guess I'll see you next year. Until then, Lord bless you.